Hey, Mountain Murders listeners. Me and Heather have some exciting news. We're hosting a brand new podcast. Bat Shit Crazy covers all things weird, spooky, mysterious, and even subversive. From conspiracy theories to demons, cults, the paranormal to porn stars and sex taboos, we try to bring well-researched information to each episode, like you expect from Mountain Murders, as we discuss, debate, and try to uncover the truth behind these topics. If anything, we promise to deliver all the horrors. Find Bat Shit Crazy for free across all platforms. Hit subscribe today. Hey guys, welcome back to Mountain Murders Offbeat. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. Yes, you are. Man, you ever have one of those days where it's like everyone in your presence or every person you come across woke up that morning and it's like, I'm going to fuck your day up like that's their only goal? It's just one of them days that Dylan goes through when he's angry inside. I did want to be all alone today. Really? Yeah. You, are you feeling like Brandy? Everything I tried to do didn't work out. You're feeling like Brandy playing second fiddle to Aaliyah? Yeah, and her brother Ray J? <laughs> oh, wait. No, she drug him along, didn't she? I don't I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, okay, okay. Enough of, of uh, showing our 90s uh, teenage years. What's up, Big D? I'm just hanging, hanging out with my wang out. You had one of those days where you were being derailed? Oh, my. See, yeah. usually you're the one that does the derailing. So today you were getting a taste of how um, how life is with you. So uh, I'm saying it's way more fun to be the derailer. But once if, you, if you're getting derailed, I, I see now that the other side of the coin is not as much fun. Well, it's fun to get railed if you've got lube. Whoa. Whoa. Hey. <laughs> that escalated quickly. It certainly did. Okay. What do you have for us? You had some true crime news. Pretty interesting stuff. Ah, uh, yes. Ronald DeFeo, killer in the Amityville horror case, dies at 69 years old. Wow. Are you familiar with this? I'm very familiar with this. I would say most true crime fans are familiar and horror fans alike. I somehow missed... The fact that Amityville was based on, like, a real case. Yeah, Ronnie DeFeo was convicted of killing his parents and four siblings at the family home in Amityville, New York. This was back in 1974. Yes, very interesting. And subsequently inspired the movie Amityville Horror Franchise and, I guess, originally the book in 1974. So, DeFeo was serving 25 years to life in prison, and he was being held at Sullivan Correctional Facility, which is in Fallsburg, New York, and he's been there since 1975, and he was transferred to the Albany Medical Center on February the 2nd. So, he was actually charged, convicted six counts of second-degree murder after he confessed to using a rifle to shoot his father, his mother, his sisters, and his brothers. My God. Just annihilated the entire family. And the victims were all found in their beds, all with gunshot wounds. This was on November 13th, 1974. And he was the oldest of the siblings at the time. He was 23. So he just uh, took it upon himself for some reason to kill his entire family. Yeah, and from what I understand, because like I said, I'm pretty familiar with the story, is that DeFeo had some issues. Like he was kind of a fuck up. And I think he worked either for his uncle or his father. Like, there was a car dealership I think he worked for. I want to say his uncle owned it. But he was just like a fuck up, always in trouble. He was drinking, doing like a lot of drugs, just kind of going nowhere, if you will. Well, yeah, but I mean, a lot of people do that, kind of spin their wheels at a point during their youth. But I mean, taking it and taking it to murder and annihilating your entire family is a whole nother cup of tea. Well, and I think there was more wrapped up in that. I don't mean he was just like a fuck up and no, like, you know, cause yeah, a lot of people go through that, but there were issues. I think the family was like, the dad was pressing down on him. Like you better get your shit together. You're going to be out on your ear. I feel like there was a story about maybe some missing money, like that he had taken some money from work. Maybe he was getting into trouble for that. And I think he was really high on drugs at the time. Well, uh, drug psychosis, it affects people in different ways, and that, that is a thing that happens. And so during his trial, DeFeo attempted to invoke the insanity defense, stating that he had heard voices in the house that encouraged him to murder 
his family. Yeah, I don't believe any of that. So DeFeo did work for his father at a Buick dealership, which was a pretty large car dealership they owned on Coney Island Avenue in Brooklyn. And people said they had a very tense relationship. The younger DeFeo, he had a reputation for drinking, taking drugs, fighting. He would get drunk, a female friend said, and get into these fights. But then the next day, like, apologize. Like, oh, I, I was blacked out. I don't even know what I was doing kind of thing. So he seemed to have this history of getting really angry, having these very violent outbursts, and then being regretful later. Yeah, if you're truly regretful, you would stay away from whatever substance that got you into that blackout state, right? I mean, honestly, I think some people have quit doing various substances because of issues like that, because that's got to be unsettling. There was also a point when he tried to have his conviction overturned and blamed his sister Dawn for the killings, like that she had killed the whole family. He walked in, managed to like get the gun from her, shot her in the process. Oh, yeah, that's convenient. Oh, yeah. I mean, this guy, he's honestly just kind of a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Just from what I know about him. And one year after the murders, George and Kathy Lutz moved into the home, and they reportedly lasted only 28 days there, claiming to have witnessed paranormal activities like odd noises, voices, and green slime oozing from the walls. So begins the myth of the Amityville Horror. Yes, exactly. Ooh, damn. Yeah, then the story, it sparked the books, and then, of course, the movie came around. And then you have, like, a whole, as you mentioned, franchise of films. Yeah, so he has passed away, and I guess that kind of closes a chapter in that entire story, right? Good riddance, fucker. I have one more i got to speak about quickly. Okay. Because it's a Florida woman. Oh, we love the Florida woman. And if you're listening out there, Florida women, we love you. We love you because we know you're not one of these Florida women. And if you are, more power to you. <laughs> Keep rocking. Do it, sister. Florida woman who allegedly pretended to be plastic surgeon botched nose job and is arrested mid-procedure. Ouch. Oh, my God. Now, that has to be... Can we admit or can we say that tattoos and plastic surgery and various other things, you shouldn't try to go cheap, right? Because you get what you, you pay for. You get what you pay for. Otherwise, you're going to end up like Priscilla Presley with a whole bunch of silicone in your face, looking all weird. Oh, my God. Whoever did that to her face really messed her up. Yeah, I think the doctor actually was using, like, pure silicone. So a Florida woman was arrested after police say that she posed as a licensed plastic surgeon and botched a man's nose job, according to the Miami Herald, which cites police... Alacar I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to mess this up. al Calira. Jimenez de Rodriguez, I can't do the R, 56, was in the middle of performing another procedure on Thursday when police arrested her. So basically, she did a nose job for a guy for $2,800. That should be your first um, hint that something's wrong, because that seems really cheap for a rhinoplasty. Then when the surgeon tells you to meet her at the day's end. <laughs> meet me down by, behind the car wash. I'm in room 168. Now, it's on the first floor just past the drink machine by the ice cooler. You'll see it. Yeah, that's not a place that a surgeon should be performing anything. Look, I would love to have rhinoplasty. It's always been my dream. But I'm thinking it's going to cost more than $2,800. I'm thinking it's going to cost more than $2,800. That's why I'm also thinking that you need to put in some overtime. <laughs> so... <laughs> She does this, guys. She's been giving this guy Botox for months. He met her through a friend, quotes, and she's given him Botox. And after a couple of months, he asked her if she can do a rhinoplasty. And she's like, yeah, sure, 2800 bucks." So this guy goes in. She does whatever she does. She's totally untrained. She's got like a little chisel and a hammer. Unlicensed. And then he has a lot of pain and discomfort afterwards and not happy at all with the results. She offers to fix it with a second procedure. <laughs> he goes back, and then I don't know what else she did, but he's still not happy. So finally, he co contacts authorities, figures out she has no credentials, not licensed to perform any kind of medicine in the state of Florida, and tells authorities they go arrest her. She's in mid-procedure on another patient. That's crazy. Look, 
I can fuck your face up for less than $2,800. Okay, I'm not a plastic surgeon. I have zero medical experience. But if you would like me to go ahead and just fuck your face up, I'll do it for a thousand bucks. Oh, my goodness. And both of those reports were according to people.com. Wow. Okay, on to what we're really here for, Heather. Well, we are still in the midst of our asylum series. And last week, we discussed Broughton Hospital, located here, very close by in Western North Carolina. Um, I think people really enjoyed listening to that. I know I got a lot of feedback on social media. Had a, a few listeners contact with stories of relatives having worked there, or they themselves have have worked there for a period, or maybe they did some sort of training there when they were going to nursing school, that kind of thing. And it seems universally agreed upon that Broughton's kind of a creepy place. Yes, and even some listeners stated they grew up in the area and like going there to get Halloween candy and things like that. They remember doing that year after year. It was like the thing to do. Pretty cool. That's pretty cool, but kind of creepy at the same time. Well, today we're going to be discussing the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. I actually went there back in the fall with my bestie, and it was a really interesting experience. So I can't wait to talk about the hospital. Oh my God, a show off. Are you ready? Yeah, well, I am ready, and I think this is uh, definitely one of the more famous asylums in all of America. Definitely. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum was built in 1858, and, well, it was built between the years 1858 and 1881. Now, the hospital itself is the largest hand-cut stone masonry building in North America, which I thought you would find fascinating, Dylan. Well, yeah, it's pretty amazing handcrafted. Yeah, Literally. this is just right up your alley, isn't it? It's also the second largest in the world next to the Kremlin, allegedly. Oh, so you're telling me the Kremlin is hand-cut hand bricks as well? Allegedly. Oh, my God. At least that's what my research says. It could be fake news. It was designed by architect Richard Andrews, and it was following the Kirkbride plan. Um, Richard Andrews used Gothic Revival and Tudor Revival styles of architecture, which definitely gives Trans-Allegheny that spooky look. Well, yeah, I think you're going to get more into the fact that, uh, I guess, Kirk... Pine Kirk, Kirkbride, yeah, we'll talk about that here Kirkbride, yeah, you pioneered the whole idea that the environment actually affects the patients. But uh, still, like I said on our other episode... This is scary as hell, so I don't... I will post photos of the asylum itself, and you will see, like, the architecture, the style, the buildings, very spooky. It's like something out of a horror movie. I mean, I could only imagine being in, like, a mental episode or some kind of mental break and being forcefully taken to this place, and then you pull up and you're drug out of whatever vehicle... And this is the place you look up upon. I know all you need is like a night sky with like lightning bolts raining down behind the asylum as you pull up, right? I mean, it's like total horror movie. Well, the Kirkbride plan was a system of mental asylum designs created by Philadelphia psychiatrist Thomas Story Kirkbride. The Kirkbride designs were constructed during the mid to late 19th century here in the United States. And Dr. Kirkbride's designs were based on his theories regarding the healing of the mentally ill. Now, he believed environment and exposure to natural light, air circulation were all crucial parts um, in healing mental illness. The hospitals were built according to the Kirkbride plan, and they would adopt different architectural styles, but what they all had in common was this bat wing style floor plan with like numerous wings sprawling outward from like a center building. And Broughton also followed that Kirkbride plan. So instead of just one big long building, they had like this intentional different halls, I guess you could look at like that, that's kind of, I guess, flared out. Yeah, like multiple wings kind of flaring out, um, you know, maybe in three directions, maybe even four directions, but it all kind of had like a center building and then the wings spanning out from it. And I think when people think of asylums, this is the style that comes to mind. Yeah, I think so. Because it's it was so prominent when these buildings were being constructed. So the original hospital was designed to house only 250 patients. It opened in 1864, and during the 1950s, it peaked with overcrowding, housing more than 2,400 patients. 
See, uh, uh, yet again, this is just almost instantly overcrowded. And to the no, to the magnitude of that, that's like what? Ten times, ten times more people than it was supposed to originally hold. I don't know how where you're even putting these beds or these people at. And I I'm no mathematician, but I don't feel like this is going to work out. No. And of course, with overcrowding comes poor conditions and treatment. The decline in treatment for the mentally ill, along with the rundown buildings, I, I mean, it was just totally like becoming decrepit. Um, it forced the hospital to close in 1994. And with the closure of Trans-Allegheny, many people in the area were left jobless and the economy really suffered. And it's located in Weston, Virginia, a Western, Weston, West Virginia. I will get that out, folks. And the area has never fully recovered from the hit. Oh, wow. So it was maybe the biggest employer in the area? It definitely was the biggest employer. The hospital has a fairly interesting, unique history, Dylan. And I know this is going to fascinate you. You love history. During the Civil War, the hospital was quite impacted. At the time the war began in 1861, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum was still in the early stages of construction. The southernmost wing was finished, and a basement and a foundation for the central building had begun. In June, Virginia's secession from the Union brought all non-war-related work to a halt. This set the scene for the most dramatic event in the history of Weston. So at 5 a.m. on the morning of June 30th, 1861, the citizens of Weston were awakened from sleep by the sound of drums and marching soldiers entering their town. It was the 7th Ohio Infantry, which had marched all night from Clarksburg, which was about 25 miles to the north. In command was Colonel Erastus Tyler. Tyler was well known to the people of Weston. He had been a furrier before the war and had bought and sold his fur products throughout Lewis County before he joined the army. So this is a guy they know that they had done business with this guy. And then here he comes with an entire infantry marching into their town. Yeah. And at that point, you can do pretty much what you want. Tyler ordered his troops to raid the town and seize any persons suspected of being associated with the Confederacy or Confederate sympathizers. One of his men, a guy named Captain List, took two armed soldiers to carry out Tyler's actual mission, which was to raid the Weston branch of the Exchange Bank of Virginia. Oh, so they were looking for money. Yeah, so it had almost $30,000 in gold, which was deposited by the state government of Virginia, because at this time it was still considered Virginia, hadn't yet become West Virginia. And this was to provide wages for the people who were building the new asylum, all the workers. So Tyler's goal was to steal this gold before it could be returned back to Richmond and used to support the Confederacy. So he, it sounds like he knew about the money, this fund to pay for the construction of the hospital. And so his intentions are to get it and fund my own part of the war. We're going to go on, take the money and run. Oh, my God. Robert McClandish, who was the banker, he lived on the second floor of the bank building, and he was told, you have to go open this vault. We want the money, and McClandish refused. So Captain List ordered the vault open anyway and ended up stealing about $27,000, which is worth well over half a million by today's standards. Yeah, what's interesting back then, before we got rid of the gold standard, this is actual gold. Yeah, and this was in gold coin. And he left about $2,300, which the books established as being due to creditors. So he takes all of this gold, $27,000 in gold, and it was taken to Wheeling, West Virginia, or what is now West Virginia, and it was helped um, fund this new state of Virginia, which in 1863 became West Virginia. So this money actually helped create this new state. Well, still, it's a dick move. It's a total dick move. Especially because this money was supposed to pay people working on the asylum. So the partially built asylum and surrounding grounds became known as Camp Tyler. Weston had many roads that were 
fairly well traveled, so it became a prominent place in the war. The southern wing of the asylum provided barracks, and the main foundation served as a stable. So control of this area was pretty important, and it did change hands several times during the course of the war. Confederate raids in 1862 and 1863 temporarily kicked out the Union troops, and then in 1864, Raiders confiscated another $5,200 from the poor banker, Mr. McClandish, and stripped the asylum of all the food and clothing that was intended for its first group of patients. <laughs> this poor banker can't win. He just he keeps getting a gun shoved in his face. He might want to change professions, right? So a geographical is strategically important geographically to yes. have control of this area. Yeah. I'm going to assume because of trade, maybe, or because main thoroughfare or the roads maybe connect in a certain way there. I'm not sure. Yes. Okay. Because of the roads, it was a very well traveled road. So this was kind of a key point. And the fact that they had this asylum, which could be used to feed and house and, you know, handle the horses and kind of became like a, you know, like a camp for these guys. Well, yeah. You have this big, it's basically like a barracks. This yeah. big open kind of room, you know, top area. And, uh, but yeah, that's some, um, I know things go sideways in times of war, but, uh, it seems like they could, n neither side cared much about what would happen to the people or the patients connected to the hospital. Yeah, right. I mean, I get all's fair in love and war, but what about the, what about the people? So once the war ended, the hospital's completion became a primary focus again. Surprisingly, Weston did not experience a post-war depression as many um, cities did, and especially in the South and especially cities that had like Confederate ties. Uh, business boomed because the asylum was being built and it became a driving force of the town's economy for years to come. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah. it brought in, you know, laborers to construct it. And then, of course, you had to hire staff. So, and then people were moving into town because they're going to work at the asylum. So it was a really like big deal. And when I visited the Southern Wing, which had been used during the Civil War, I have to say it was one of the most haunted places I've ever been. Really? Like the experience I had while I was in that wing was so overwhelming that I actually had to leave a certain area and like step outside. There was a doorway and I had to go catch my breath. And, of course, my friend is like, are you okay? And I was like, man, I felt a really dark energy so I've in got, this area. I've got to say, as a skeptic, part of me is skeptic. I, you know, I've heard and seen some weird stuff. So you're on this tour, a, a, an actual real tour. Yeah, we actually did two tours. So we went during the day and did the historical tour, which was amazing. Our guide was so informed had so many great stories. I mean, she was such an asset to that place. She knew the ins and outs. Any question you had, she knew an answer for you. And it was awesome. Like, it was so great. I'm really glad we did both tours. And then we went back in the evening and did the paranormal tour. So my question is, what you experienced, could it have been the people connected to the tour messing around to make it like a cool experience? Or did what you experienced... It was just impossible, or you know that it wasn't just someone down the hall scratching on the wall or something. Well, no, the experience I'm talking about here with the Southern Wing, this actually happened during the daytime, and it was while I was on the historic tour. And our tour leader is, you know, taking the group through. She's explaining the history. This is the area where the Civil War soldiers were. You know, she's just talking, whatever. And there was this room kind of off to the left side of, of like this big kind of open space which I think at one point maybe had been like a cafeteria and there was like this little room there and for whatever reason something was really like not good in that little room like I was getting this really really bad feeling and I had to step outside like when we got around the corner and uh, I had to get some fresh air I, I don't know okay. it was just a really dark energy so I had like an oppressive yeah dark energy like I was not feeling it okay and this was during the day. So this was not even during the evening, like, ghost tour. So, yes. no, it wasn't like I heard a noise or anything like that. I just became overwhelmed with this really, like, a bad, bad feeling. 
Yes, it sounds like that same energy we experienced when we went to the tax office to turn in our taxes. Well, there was that, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I couldn't breathe in that place. Yeah, no, it was a super suffocating feeling. Like, it was just not a good feeling. Whatever was, like, the energy there, I didn't like it. Okay. So, as I mentioned earlier, there were some skilled stonemasons working on the project, and many of them came from Europe. These workers carved faces in the stone masonry of the building. Irish workers were superstitious, so they added the carved faces to the outside of the hospital to ward off evil spirits. And these creepy faces could still be seen today really? above doorways. And I'll actually post a few photos on social media. You guys can check those out on Instagram and Twitter. Um, yeah, so not only do you have this asylum and the architecture spooky, but then you have these weird, twisted, grotesque faces carved Above the doorways. Oh, so they're not like even normal faces. They're just, um, they're like weird and they're strange. They're weird faces, bro. <laughs> oh my God. The first patients were admitted in October of 1864. Now, the very first patient was a housewife who was said to be suffering from domestic trouble. Oh, that sounds like her husband just put her in the asylum to get rid of her. She just didn't want to wash the fucking windows, bro. Well, maybe she just wanted to be her own woman. Maybe she just didn't want to do the laundry anymore, and I understand that feeling. Maybe she thought she could get a job and like she, being your slave at home wasn't her only calling in life. Yeah, like maybe she was just like years ahead of reading The Feminine Mystique, but she was all about it. Well, the first logbook used at the hospital listed reasons for patient admission, and it included a lot of strange things, as we mentioned in the Broughton episode. So there was things like um, grief, congestion of the brain. Oh, my God. I think I've had that before. Seduction, novel reading. <laughs> what? Reading a book? How dare you read those books, you randy romancer? I mean, okay. What's some, is there any more reasons you got there? Uh, yeah, I'll get to some of these. So in the early days, asylums were seen more like holding cells for more than just the mentally ill. Like in our Broughton Hospital episode, people were committed for ridiculous reasons, laziness, political enthusiasm. Uh, yeah, I could see that. Well, yeah, that's just, um, that's no different than what's happened in many countries around the world. I think you could be locked up for political enthusiasm. Well, that's no different than putting someone, jailing your political opponents. I mean, really. Menopause, superstition, domestic trouble, masturbation, and tuberculosis. Asylums were often the dumping ground for societies unwanted, and Trans-Allegheny offered money to anyone who would drop off a patient. And many of these people showed no signs of mental illness when they first were committed to the hospital. Well, that just seems like a bad program. It seems like you're asking to be overcrowded for one. The guide told us a story of one man who dropped his wife off at the asylum because he wanted to have an affair. And since divorce was frowned upon, he thought it would be more acceptable if he had his wife committed and then he could carry on the affair. Because if he had an afflicted wife, people would take pity on him and they would judge him as harshly for having an extramarital affair. He's just looking for love in all the wrong places because his poor wife... I wonder what her opinion on this whole situation was. Well, I don't know. She might have been glad to get the fuck away from him. It sounds like a dick. They probably had to drag her kicking and screaming. She probably wanted away from him, but still, who would want to go into a place like that? Yeah, I know. Could you imagine? Um, so here you are. Now, that would be even scarier than if you were having real mental issues. To be completely fine and taken to a place like this. And back then, if your husband said what your husband said goes... The places, you, all, most of the administration's men, and you know, and they view women a certain way. And, and you're, com hysterical. you're completely fine, but he's saying you're crazy or whatever. And they're like just getting the straight jacket and big orderlies coming out and just, you know, I'm like, oh, that's what all the people with problems say. They're, they're fine. And they're just dragging you, dragging you away behind the locked doors. I would give that motherfucker something to have me committed for. You know what I'm saying? So you would do something. I, I'd do something. Oh, my God. That would be so no, scary. It's a ho no, that's horrible. It's like a fucking nightmare. It's like a waking nightmare. It's a terrible nightmare. I don't ever want to be locked away like that. Please. I don't think they let me do it nowadays anyway, but I don't even have the intentions of trying to do it to you. Look, just leave me alone for three to five days of the month, okay? And then I'll be fine the rest of the time, as we've learned. It's true. I've survived this long. Trans-Allegheny was a self-sufficient hospital. They raised their own vegetables, maintained dairy cows, and operated an ice plant. 
At one point, 532 acres was used for farming. They had 133 dairy cows and heifers, five bulls, 35 sows, and two boars. They provided all the milk and pork for the residents and staff. A nearby coal mine supplied fuel for heat, and there was a reservoir for drinking water. All of the patients' clothing, curtains, fabrics, linens, everything were made right at Weston, as well as mattresses and most of the furniture was made at the hospital by patients. Yeah, it's a reoccurring theme, the self-sufficient system. But I think it's being, I think it's instituted in the first place out of necessity because these places tend to be in rather rural areas. Back then, you know, the there was we weren't as connected with the roads and everything didn't move as efficiently. So, and you get this amount of people in one area. So I think that's why they were built this way with this in mind, this self-sufficiency. You're absolutely right, Dylan. And in the 19th century, there was this belief that institutions should be self-sufficient and that patients needed to learn a trade. Well, okay. And and I I say it would be good for the patients to a degree, unless it's forced or like, you know, really hard work they don't want to do to get out in, in the gardens or work some of the vegetables and crops. I think it's good. Maybe gives them a sense of purpose in a way. Well, yeah. And they were also making the clothing, the curtains, making mattresses, making furniture. So they were learning skills. And at the time in psychiatry, there was the belief that, you know, if you were able to work and learn these things, that it would be good for like self-esteem and that it could help, you know, almost like a, almost as like a therapy. Yeah. As long as that's not abused, which oftentimes it was. But as long as that's not abused, I I agree with that. The sprawling campus, 600 acres of campus, by the way, it also had a cemetery for patients who passed away, which is kind of a little spooky. So 600 acres is a fairly large area, right? Yeah. And you set up hundreds of acres used for crops. 532 acres were used for farming and livestock. Wow. That's a big area. I mean, that's a lot going on. It's a chunk. Several fires were set by patients over the years, including a big fire in October of 1935, which I believe was set by an 18-year-old male patient, and it ravaged the fourth floor of the hospital. Now, it was fortunate that no one was killed during the fire, but of course, it's no wonder with the treatments that some of the patients might want to burn the place to the ground. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you you went over these before, some of those treatments, and it was, uh, even with the ones you've named off, it was literally whatever the doctor, the head doctor said went, and whatever he wanted to try, and, you know, different doctors would come to these places just to try new things or ideas they had out on real people. I mean, it's it's really wild how much leeway they had with treatments and things like that. Over the years, a number of medical practices were used and implemented. Ice water baths, the hydrotherapy, seclusion cells, electroshock therapy, and lobotomies were all used on patients. At one point, one of the favored procedures that was used extensively was the ice pick lobotomy. Now, this crude procedure we've discussed before, but I'll go over it again. It utilized a one or two pronged device that was driven through the orbital socket of the eye and into the brain, usually with like a sharp blow. And the permanent damage was thought to relieve some of the patient's severe, more severe symptoms. Well, yeah, but the, in, in reality... They were damaging the front part of their brain and they were causing severe, significant brain damage. And so what they took for, you had someone who's uncontrollable or however you want to describe it beforehand. And now they're kind of just over in the corner standing, slobbering on themselves. They took that as a success. In the early 1950s, Walter Freeman, um, and if you're familiar with lobotomies and you've heard that name, He led a program called the West Virginia Lobotomy Project, and it was an effort to treat patients in the asylum. Freeman had no formal surgical training. He performed over 4,000 lobotomy surgeries um, over about 40 years. It's a lot of lobotomies. Well, I mean, that's when it's on other doctors and people who are trained and have went to school and have all this understanding and knowledge about medicine 
to say, wait a minute, this guy's not even accredited in any way. Why are we allowing him to do this stuff? But it was like the wild, wild west. And he pioneered the ice pick lobotomy. And this procedure was performed without anesthesia, and then it used an electroconvulsive therapy to induce a seizure in the patient. Now, according to stories at the asylum, doctors and nursing staff, when Freeman first arrived, had compiled a list of patients they felt could benefit from the lobotomy. And it included a lot of patients who were deemed, like, incredibly dangerous. Danger to themselves, danger to other people. But instead, Freeman walked down the hallways, randomly choosing patients. Some of them definitely did not need a lobotomy. So... He completely disregarded the suggestions of the staff, the doctors who were at the hospital, who were familiar with these people, and just picked whomever he felt like, I don't like the way this guy looks, so I'm going to give him a lobotomy. Well, and that right there shows his him not being schooled or no training, no respect for procedure, no respect for other people's opinions. Like I would think if someone had went through medical school and all that, they would appreciate them coming in and saying, okay, here's the ones we think can benefit from, in our opinion. We spend time with them every day. Here's the most violent, the most hard to handle. And that just that just shows he's untrained. I well, mean, Freeman was just out of control. Yeah. He had, like, he just wasn't, he did not need to be doing these things. No, I think he got some kind of sick. No, he was like a sadist, def- yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah, totally. Almost 40% of Freeman's patients were gay individuals who were subjected to a lobotomy in an effort to alter their homosexuality. The procedure left most of these perfectly healthy individuals severely disabled for the rest of their lives. Many of Freeman's patients had to be like retaught to perform basic functions like eating and using the bathroom. Around 15% of his patients died from the procedure. Well, yeah, you're jamming a spike into their brain. I could see that going sideways. Now, as we mentioned earlier, some of the other practices included electroshock therapy, which was introduced to hospitals in the 1940s. So with electroshock therapy, electrodes were placed at the temples with electric jolts being sent through the temporal lobes. And most patients would get shock therapy about three times per week. I just don't even know what they think it, they're what they're achieve, they think they're achieving with this. I mean, Hydrotherapy and occupational therapy were also used at the hospital, and a psychology department was founded in 1950 where psychotherapy was introduced. However, there was only one like psychiatrist per 147 patients, which meant that you know, even with the introduction of psychotherapy, patients were really not getting their needs met. They weren't able to have, like, the one-on-one sessions. They weren't getting the counseling. No, there's that's, that's not a, nowhere near enough psychiatrists for that amount of patients. However, there were also a number of activities and entertainment provided by the hospital. So each month, the hospital hosted a big dance, usually hiring an outside orchestra to play. In one year alone, they hosted, like, 132 dances. Well, maybe they should cut out some of the dances and hire some more doctors, real doctors, and psychiatrists. And these were attended, um, like, not only by the patients, but also the community. Like, this was the place to be. So it sounds like it was maybe in the spirit of a ball, like an elegant ball, maybe? Yeah, or just, you know, like, similar maybe to, like, a barn dance or something, just like a big community dance, and they would hire an orchestra or... You know, sometimes I guess they would just have records and that kind of stuff. But once a month, they did have an orchestra come in and play. So it was for patients. It was for the community. And they had a big kind of a ballroom area, which also doubled as like a basketball court. And from what I understood from the guide, some of the local like basketball players would come in and play with the patients and kind of coach them. Well, see, those are good programs. And even the dances could be beneficial because for one... The locals can mingle with the patients, which is good for some patients who are trying to recover, maybe get back into society. And it's also good for the locals to be like, hey, you know, these people aren't so bad. And they were able to utilize the space. I mean, the ballroom was really big, nice, beautiful. You had this lovely campus, this big building. And you've got to consider, I mean, they're in West Virginia and they're in a pretty rural area. So this really provided some nightlife for the community. Um, They showed films. They had a big screen in the ballroom. They hosted bingo games. They had chapel services. 
Uh, p- card games were available. They had ping pong tables and shuffleboard. In the summertime, there was a men's softball team, and women were allowed to play badminton, volleyball, or croquet on the lawn. So, yeah, these institutions are like a part of the community in these areas. They're very important, and it seems like, um, I don't know if it's by design, but they come become an integral part of the community and everyone interacts with it in one way or the other. Well, and you have to consider so many people that lived in this area were employed at the hospital. So it gave them an opportunity to like bring their family, friends to the hospital. That's where they worked and they were able to mingle with, you know, their friends, family, other staff members. So, I mean, yeah, it was kind of a, like a really positive thing. In 2007, a West Virginia businessman named Joe Jordan purchased the former asylum through auction And he wanted to preserve and restore portions of the building. The facility now offers a variety of tours and experiences. They've got the paranormal tours. They have heritage and history tours. They offer ghost hunts. You can go to the facility's farm, the cemeteries. They have some outward buildings um, that you can go to as well. Uh, While we were there, they were hosting a haunted house in one of the buildings. A few areas in the center of the building have been restored to resemble how the asylum would have looked during its operation. They have nurses' quarters, doctors' quarters, and some of the other rooms that would have been like patient rooms have been cleaned up and restored. But most of the buildings have been left like in an abandoned state. Intentionally. Well, yeah. I mean, they just don't have the finances to restore. We're talking, you know, massive building (laughs) no it would take millions and millions of dollars to get it all restored like we were able to go into like the medical building which was directly behind that south wing where the civil war wing was or whatever and that medical building i mean we went on the first floor but it was pretty run down like there's probably no way you could have gone up to the second or third floors it just it looked really sketchy well, yeah, but that's a that's pretty cool that someone has does own it and they have you know preserving it in mind. Well, yeah, and through the tour, like the money that they make at the hospital, they're allowed to like you know use that money to reinvest back in the buildings and try to bring other parts up to snuff, if you will. And then they host events there as well, like fundraisers and things like that. So let's talk about some of the creepier stuff. There were several cases of patients killing other patients. In one instance, two patients hanged one of their fellow patients using a bed sheet. When uh, he didn't die, they cut him down and they used a metal bed frame to crush his head. Oh, no. One evening, a nurse went missing and her body was found about two months later at the bottom of an unused staircase. Well, you know, that could have been uh, that could have been another employee who was a murderer. In 1992, a patient named George Bodie died after a fight with another patient. A guy named Brian Scott B., who was a patient there, committed suicide, and they didn't find his body for like eight days. Hmm. No. Reports of hauntings and the sounds of restless spirits are pretty common, Some workers were said to have stayed only a few days and would quit after hearing all the noises, squeaky wheels of gurneys rolling along the highway or the the highway, the hallway. (laughs) Um, Thousands were committed to the asylum over the years and many died there. There are over 2000 people buried in the cemetery on the property. Um, The spirits at Trans Allegheny are numerous and range from Civil War era ghosts to children Um, even ex-patients and staff members. There were murderers, rapists, and many violent offenders that were housed, you know, on certain wards there. And those are some of the most haunted wards. Um, So people think those spirits continue to dwell. Well, I mean, between the war and between all the other things connected to their being an insane asylum, as they called them back then, I I think there's... Definitely a very strong energy still imprinted on the property and the buildings themselves. Sightings include staff and visitors seeing ghostly figures, apparitions walking the hallways at night, glimpsing shadowy figures at all hours, even in the daytime. One doctor claimed that a spirit followed her home and continued, I guess even today, to haunt her. Oh my God, she's getting stalked by the spirit. 
Other people have seen balls of light moving up and down the hallways, um, apparitions floating around, dressed in white, disappearing in rooms. On the first floor of the building, the Civil War Wing, it's the oldest part of the hospital, and there is a former patient by the name of Ruth who is said to lurk this area. It's unknown the reasons why she didn't like men, but apparently Ruth hated men and had a practice of throwing things at men. So today her spirit still wanders that hallway and men have reported feeling like they've been pushed up against walls. They've heard whistling sounds emanating up and down the hallway. So she still continues to dislike men. Oh, she's cat calling the men down the hallway. Even in her, her ghostly, um, her ghostly self still is a part of the man hating club. In Ward 2 of the second floor, a couple of violent events occurred. There's one room where a man was stabbed 17 times by another patient. And in a different room on that same floor, two patients committed suicide by hanging themselves from curtain rods. Um, There there have been EVPs captured, one of them even saying, get out, pretty clearly. Um, There have been shadowy figures often seen lurking in this particular area. I mean, there's a lot of ghosts. There's a ghost by the name of Big Jim, who is a pretty big presence on the third floor. So Big Jim is said to lurk the hallways there. And um, he's known to, like, turn uh, flashlights on and off. Oh, no. Which was something we experienced when we were there on the ghost tour. Really? Multiple flashlights. Our tour guide would be like, hey, Big Jim, will you turn the flashlight off? Because a lot of people had brought their own flashlights and someone would put a flashlight down and then it would like flick off and on multiple times. Oh, man. So I don't know if it was a big gym, but it was pretty, pretty scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, screw, scary. Screw that. And I actually have quite a few videos of my experience with the flashlight at Trans Allegheny. So I might go post those on our Instagram page. People can check that out. On the fourth floor is another well-known spirit, which is a child named Lily. And there's a big room on this floor that's filled with toys, and she's always waiting for someone to play with her. She's said to wear a white dress, and she's about nine years old, and she loves to play games with visitors and staff, and she'll move toys around, and often the music box will turn on and off by itself, along with some of the toys, like keyboards will play music at random. Yeah, I'm not messing around with any of that. Which I did see that happen while I was there. (laughs) Yeah. So in this toy room, there was this teddy bear and uh, one of the guys, you know, put the flashlight down. Our guide was like, hey, Lily, you want to play a game? You want to turn this light on and off and stuff like that? And the flashlight did turn off and on a few times. Well, then that guy like picked up that bear and was like holding it. And when he did, we like all heard this crazy noise. And she was like, you might want to put that bear down. And he did. And then the guy was like, did that make you mad, Lily, when he picked up your toy? And the flashlight like flipped on and off again. What the hell? <laughs> we were all like, ah! That was pretty crazy. So legend has it that Lily was a little girl. She spent most of her life inside the walls of the asylum. She was dropped off at the hospital by her parents. And she died of pneumonia when she was nine, and she's never left the only home that she ever knew. So Lily's there right now. The little girl. Yeah. Her spirit. There is also this thing they call the Creeper, and it was captured on one of the ghost shows. I want to say it was Ghost Adventures. It's, I watched the video, and it's pretty crazy. You can see, like, this black mass like slither it looks like it's slithering like down the wall and across the floor behind one of the hosts of the show and our tour guide described this as a manifestation of several dark spirits and she was so scared of the creeper that we were not allowed to go on that wing during our tour oh she's like we're not even messing with that no we went up to like where you know it's like the bat wings and she's like we'll go on like the south end but we're not going on the north end and there was a separate tour and that guide took her group to the other to that end but our guide was like hell no we're not going down there that's like the one place i refuse to go well yeah i don't need to see the creeper yeah because that would scare me for the rest of my life if i experienced that in person 
So to deal with some of the more violent and uncontrollable patients, many of these people were kept in cages, seclusion cells, or confinement cribs. And today you can still see metal rings on some of the walls of these seclusion cells where these patients were chained up. And on the floors of the cells are drains. So they could hose down the cells after the chained up patients were released because they were left in these rooms to wallow in their own filth for days at a time. Yeah, well, that's inhumane. No one short of a child molester or a rapist or a murderer, a a violent murderer, and there's some circumstances where it's different. Regular patients who are supposedly getting health help and care for their mental illnesses should never be left like that. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. And I couldn't work. Could you work at a place like that? It was a very disturbing. I couldn't work. I couldn't see that and know that this person has been left in here for 24 hours plus, you know, ba- barely, you know, getting any nutrition. They're dirty. They're not being cleaned. They don't have clean clothes, a clean place to lay down. They're chained up against a wall. Like it's a fucking dungeon. No, dude, they're like chained in the middle with their arms stretched out. Oh my God. Yeah. That's like some saw shit. No, it totally is. Is super disturbing. They actually have some mannequins chained up as if they were like patients. And just seeing that was very disturbing. Yeah. To know that real people were done that way. Yeah. So the hospital has been featured on several paranormal shows, including ghost adventures, sci-fi's ghost hunters, paranormal lockdown, Portals to Hell, and Destination Fear. So if you want a closer look at the hospital and some of the super creepy stuff that allegedly happens there, you can uh, find those shows. A lot of them are on YouTube. It's actually where I saw the show with the creeper in the background. Yeah, but that place sounds really creepy, and I would like to go there in person one day. We will. Oh, my God. I'll take you there. Wow, is that the, have we come to a conclusion on the Trans Allegheny Mental Hospital? The end. <laughs> oh, that, that's good because I found a guy on Craigslist who was going to give me a discounted um, lipo suction. Oh, cool! Yeah, he says seventy five bucks. He's got a water hose. Yup, just the hose. Yup. And uh, is he going to like siphon the fat out of you like it's a uh, like he's trying to steal from your gas tank? <laughs> I don't know, but he swears that he is an accredited practitioner of plastic surgery in the state of North Carolina. He's going to give me a breast lift, but it's just like he staples my boobs up a little bit higher with a big staple gun. He just gets some duct tape and takes it up around your shoulders and makes like a duct tape harness for well, your tits. you know what? He'd need a lot of duct tape, okay? Ah, uh, yeah, baby. These bad boys is hanging very low these days. All right. So thank you for joining us for this offbeat. Yeah. Please join us on Patreon so we can not have botched plastic surgery and you can sign up at patreon.com slash mountain murders podcast, where you can access bonus content as well as ad free episodes. It's true. There's loads of content and we love each and every one of you. And the fun thing is Dylan gets a little tipsy on there sometimes and he gets emotional. You're never going to let me forget that, are I'm you? Never going to let you forget that. Oh my God. We love you, Dylan. I love you. You Without you, magi- mountain murders would not have the magic. <laughs> it's your wizard wizardry that makes it amazing. I'm feeling wizardress right now. You look like a wizard. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're going to peace out. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Don't forget to download Offbeat um, every Wednesday. That's true. And Mountain Murders will be coming right at you, right at your face on Sunday. Yeah, and if you're feeling froggy and want to hear about even more weird stuff, check us out on Batshit Crazy that drops every Tuesday. That's true, Dylan. Oh, my God. You're awesome. I love you. Let's sign off now. Okay, I love you, too. I I just feel like I want to keep talking to our listeners. Now we're just making it weird. No, just keep it going. Just let's okay. let's do like a twenty four hour podcast. Oh my god, live. we could do like a telethon, like a like a twenty four hour telethon. Yeah, and people can just tune in, and we'll be doing like weird stuff to try to keep awake. Oh, dude, yeah, It'll like just be a, like me eating bowls of cereal and stuff like like a vaudeville act. Yeah, I'll get out my feather fans. Oh, you wouldn't believe what people do if you're flipping around on TikTok, which I seldom do. The things they're doing on their lives, it's weird. It's like it'll just be live, and they're just like eating cereal. Watching TV and like people or you look on there's like 19 people watching. I could be a master at eating cereal live. 
Oh my god! I fucking love cereal. Okay, we gotta let them go. Cereal. We gotta wrap it up. Okay, wrap it up. Make sure you wrap your thing up. Let's uh, say goodbye. We'll be back on Sunday. Bye. Bye.